So my last name's German too, and it's actually Thielman. So. <laughs> what are you gonna do, George? What are you gonna do? You know. <laughs> I think in Germany they pronounce it Thielman. So <clears throat> I, um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about the Christ Ray schools. And uh, as I was hearing George speak, uh, I was I was thinking back 20 years ago. We were not. Uh, we were not celebrated like this. In fact, we had to kind of fight our way into meetings and we had to fight our way into the conversation and now uh, the, the tide's turned. And so we are grateful for that. It's also good to be here with G.R. Kearney. G.R. Kearney is the author of More Than a Dream. And uh, in 1999, George and I met at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School. His dad uh, went to school with Father John Foley, the founder of the first Cristo Rey School. And G.R. came to us and said he'd like to do something with his life after Georgetown, and he had a couple of buddies who wanted to come with him and volunteer at Cristo Rey. And uh, First Father Foley, our boss, said, I don't know, George, we don't have a place for you. I don't know where that, that's going to work. And then John and I were driving back from meeting. He said, you know, I think I ought to call those young guys and put them to work here. And then he called you, and then he said, you know what? Instead of that one-year deal, I want you to stay for two years. And you stayed for two years. And so that was kind of how John Foley started the Cristo Rey schools. He'd kind of hear an idea, he kind of be like, you know, middle-aged men like us. No, nah, that's not going to work. And then, uh, then he'd call you back and he'd say, why don't you stay for a longer period of time and really make it work? And that's what GR and two other young guys did. Well, I want to thank uh, my co-writer, Bill Donovan, who uh, is here today. Bill's a journalist who uh, tried to remain objective as he researched the Cristo Rey schools, but I couldn't help... Uh, but notice how enthusiastic he, came about our, uh, he became about our mission as he studied the schools and got to know us better. It's also nice to reconnect with Rick Henkin. Rick Henkin was one of the first uh, corporate uh, uh, work-study sponsors for then North Cambridge Catholic High School, now Cristo Rey Boston High School, and uh, he has been a very generous supporter of Catholic schools and the Cristo Rey schools. And it's good to be here today with Sister Mary Alice Gilfeather, the president of Notre Dame Cristo Rey High School, and Sister Mary Murphy, SND, the first president of Cristo Rey uh, Notre Dame High School in uh, Notre Dame Cristo Rey High School in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And um, also good to see Kevin Kraska, the president of our school in Dorchester Cristo Rey Boston High School. When uh, <clears throat> we were doing a feasibility study here in Boston, I called a number of different religious orders including the Jesuits, who I'm about to praise in, this, uh, in my remarks. <laughs> and uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame called me back. No. They agreed to do the feasibility study in Boston, and they agreed to start the first school in Boston. So the Sisters, the Sisters called me back. And <clears throat> so <laughs> think about that. So uh, if you uh, represent a company, or uh, you, you, you have some loose change, please see Kevin and Sister Mary Alice after this presentation. The Cristo Rey movement began when the Jesuits of the Chicago province, which is now the Midwest province, took over a parish in a place called Pilsen Little Village, a Mexican-American neighbor, Mexican neighborhood on Chicago's southwest side. A young Jesuit named Father Jim Gartland, who is now the rector of the Faber Jesuit community in Brighton, conducted a feasibility study. He and other Jesuits went out and talked with people in the community. The people told the Jesuits that the greatest educational need in their neighborhood was a high school. Many mothers came to meetings with Father Gartland and told him how worried they were about their children's futures. The public high schools had high dropout rates. Gangs were everywhere and college was not a possibility for most young people in Pilsen Little Village. The mothers told Father Gartland, yo quiero que mi hijo sea profesional. Yo quiero que mi hijo vaya a la universidad. I want my son or my daughter to be a professional. I want my son or daughter to go to college. Can you make that happen, Father? It is important to understand the context <clears throat> in which the Jesuits worked. In early 1995, as the feasibility study Father Gartland was running was coming to an end, the Jesuits held their 34th general congregation, or a meeting in which representatives 
of the Jesuits from around the world gathered in Rome to discuss how to proceed as one century was drawing to a close and a new one was about to begin. <clears throat> in the documents of that meeting, the Jesuits wrote, Jesuits are never content with the status quo, the known, the tried, the already existing. For us, frontiers and boundaries are not obstacles or ends, but new challenges to be faced, new opportunities to be welcomed. Indeed, ours is a holy boldness, a certain apostolic aggressivity, typical of our way of proceeding. That line was the one that our founder, Father John Foley, reminded us of constantly as we went about the work of creating the first Christ Array school and the schools that followed. That was a frequent phrase, a frequent term that he used when he led us on retreat. He asked us to think about that phrase, think about that statement of the Jesuits, think about how we could be holy, bold people. Inspired by the 34th General Congregation, the Jesuits reflected on what they heard at the focus groups, and they decided to open a Catholic high school exclusively for kids who cannot afford private education. The first school, school was called Cristo Rey Jesuit High School, which means Christ the King in Spanish. And its first president was Father Foley. John Foley told me once that the Jesuit approach to solving problems is as follows. First you identify the problem, then you find a solution, and then you worry about the money. <coughs> which means you bring in the lay people to figure out what to do. With the help of a consultant, a layman, the Jesuits came up with a simple and ingenious way to cover most of the costs of the school. Every student would work to earn tuition and gain real world experience. Four students would share a full-time entry-level job, each working five eight-hour days per month. The students would have enough classroom hours to be ready for college, in addition to working more than 300 hours per year in their work-study jobs. So every Christo Rey kid has about an extra year of high school when you include the work-study time. The students became W-2 employees of the work-study business, and they signed assignment forms to assign their earnings to the school to pay tuition. The students, these young people, never see a dime of what they make on the work-study job. <clears throat> Not only that, each student has to pay something in tuition. They have to contribute something every month to the cost of that school. And the school had to raise about a 30% of its cost through fundraising. When Melinda Gates visited us at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School in the early 2000s, she remarked that the reason why her husband and she gave $16 million to start Cristo Rey schools around the country is that there were so many stakeholders in the mission led by the students themselves who were working to earn their tuition. Cristo Rey Jesuit High School opened in Chicago in 1996, and I joined the staff in 1997 as a member of the leadership team and its first development director. We learned very quickly that the work-study program was much more than a way to pay the bills. By giving students exposure to the real world, they saw the practical applicability of their learning. They became more mature, and they became more serious about school. The combination of school and work distinguished Christa Ray students from others seeking college admission, and in short order, Christa Ray began graduating students with the grit and the discipline to enter and graduate from college. The mission transformed others as well. Rick Henkin made mention of this. We heard stories of employees and C-suite executives who marveled at the grit and the resiliency of our kids. Corporate leaders found that it made good business sense to hire Christa Ray students because they needed to get entry-level work done. Kids share and do entry-level jobs. And their employees were proud of the fact that their company was helping center city youth prepare for college. One thing we learned early on was that the work study program was a business and had to be run accordingly. Students had to arrive on time for work. The school needed staff who could respond to the needs of the corporations. A summer training program was mandatory to get young people ready for work. 
And if a student couldn't keep a job, and after retraining didn't work, the student had to leave the school. In 2000, a benefactor, B.J. Casson, whose goddaughter is here today somewhere, Anne is here, <coughs> uh, <coughs> visited us at Christ Ray Jesuit High School in Chicago. B.J. grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. He went to Keith Academy, a Catholic school that closed, and he was always sad about the closing of that school in uh, Lowell. Then he went to Holy Cross, which is still open. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, then he joined the United States Marine Corps, and after five years in the Marine Corps, he entered the business world and became a very successful venture capitalist. He was an early funder of the uh, Oracle Corporation. And <clears throat> when he sat down with us, he said, as a venture capitalist, I invest in good ideas and help them to grow. And I like this Christ Array idea. I want to invest in it, and I want to help it grow across the country. And so that's what we did. He hired me to run his foundation in the year 2000, 2001. And then in 2002, we formally started the Christ Array Network to manage the growth of the schools across the United States. We secured funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and from other funders. And <clears throat> as Tom said, I oversaw 32 feasibility studies that led to the creation of the nation's first 24 Christ Array schools. Today, there are 32 schools in 21 states serving 11,000 students and there are more than 12,000 graduates of the Christ Array schools. Today, the Christ Array Network is the largest organization or not largest network of high schools of any kind in the United States. Every school started the same way Christ Array Jesuit High School did, with a study that examined the needs of the young people in the community. When we formed the Christ Array Network, we developed a set of standards that all schools had to follow. The schools had to be Catholic, and they had to be approved by the local bishop or archbishop. They could only serve, exclusively serve, students with limited financial resources, and we developed a formula and a system to make sure that happened. The schools had to serve young people of all faiths. Every student had to participate in the work-study program, and the goal of the school was to prepare every young person for college to answer the call of those mothers who came to the Christ Array focus groups in the early 1990s. Yo quiero que mi hijo sea profesional. I want my son or my daughter to be a professional. The fact that all of the young people in the Christ Array schools were from low-income families forced the staff around the country to think differently about teaching and learning. The average young person enters a Christ Array school at least a grade below level. Our task, the task of the staff at the Christ Array schools, is to get them ready for college in just four short years. When you read the article, you'll learn that each school in the network, including the two in Massachusetts, studied student data, gathered best practices, and tried to modify a few, a few different approaches to get read, kids ready for upper level courses. Eventually, each school, along with the other schools in the network, found unique ways to remediate math and language skills in the early grades and then get students into honors level and advanced placement courses by their final years in high school. The fact that we were only serving low-income students, that all of the students, practically all the students were behind academically, forced us as a faculty and staff to come up with unique ways to educate the young people in our charge. You should know that the two schools in Massachusetts are in the top tier of the 32 Cristo Rey schools in the nation and the number of students from their schools who enter and graduate from college. In fact, the combination of work, faith, and education, and academic programs that we have at the Christ Array schools has enabled our kids, the Christ Array kids, to enter and graduate college at higher rates than black and Latino young people across the United States. As you read in the article, we do not succeed with every child. Our retention rates from ninth grade to graduation across the Christ Array network are not as high as any of us would like. Partly this is because we take chances on kids that other private and even some public schools do not want. But every young person is touched by their experience at a Christ Array school. About a year ago, I ran into a student on the T who said hello and said he went to Christ Array Boston when I was the president of the school. He told me he transferred to another school. What happened, I asked him. He responded, Mr. Thielman, I had two great years at Christ Array and still love the school. 
I was looking for an easier road, but now I'm back on the right path and I'm going to college. Somehow, despite the fact that he left our school, Cristo Rey touched him and changed his life. It takes a lot of work to get kids ready for college and life. I can remember one student we admitted as a sophomore transfer. transfer. He had a fixed mindset and was comfortable with failure, like a lot of our kids. He was afraid to risk putting effort into his studies and not succeed, so he didn't try at school at first. Our teachers refused to give up on him. He struggled as a sophomore, repeated his junior year, started working harder in school, and now attends a local college. From what I hear, he is doing well. That's the story of a lot of our kids. It's struggle, it's hard work, it's teachers caring, it's administrators caring, and then kids responding. You gotta understand that a lot of our kids, a lot of our kids have had adults let them down all their lives. And when they go to a Christ or race school, if the adults stick with them, if the adults believe in them, they respond. Some of our kids, like Lisa Edward, <coughs> uh, are in graduate school at Boston College and other places. You're gonna hear from Lisa shortly. One former student, Alejandra Tejada, who I remember well as someone who got off to a rocky start at uh, Cristo Rey Boston High School. I've got to go down there and see her. Uh, <clears throat> she, uh, she is now teaching at Cristo Rey Boston High School. Unbelievable if you knew this kid when I knew her as a 14-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. that was good. But uh, very, 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 very proud of, of, uh, of all the kids. There are at least 12,000 stories of young people who have been transformed by the Cristo Rey schools and 11,000 stories taking right taking place right now in 21 states across America. And with 2,500 companies employing Cristo Rey students, thousands of people in and out of corporate America have been inspired and transformed by the Cristo Rey movement. All of this work is done in a uniquely Christian and Catholic context. In the story of the conversion of Saul in the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus tells Saul, now get up, and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. That's what the Christo Rey movement is all about. Sister Mary Alice, Kevin Kraska, and school leaders across the country get up every day, go into the city, and are told what to do by the people they serve. And in the city, they follow the spirit of holy boldness that the Jesuits mandated for all of us a quarter of a century ago. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the article, and I look forward to the panel discussion that's about to begin.